Welcome to Emmanuel. It's a beautiful day again here on our campus, hopefully wherever you are as well. We continue our Ask the Pastor series today as we explore what it means in the Apostles' Creed to say that Jesus descended into hell. So we'll explore that. We'll take a, a look at, at what hell actually is, the place or the state, and also what it means for Jesus to go to that place what it means for us as God's people, and what it means for the world as well as we proclaim the same victory that Jesus has won over death and hell itself. A couple of things just to keep in mind once again. At the very end of our, of our service today, there's a slideshow that is honoring all of our educators. Many of our students have gone back to school this week or are preparing to do so soon, soon. So we want to honor all of those who are involved in the education of, of our children as well as adults uh, during these challenging days. So we look forward to that. And finally, we begin our, our new series in just a couple of weeks. And along with the sermon series, When You Pray, we have a great small group study to go with it that you can, can join in either with your family at home or in person in a small group. So you can, can go to the link and you can find out more about how you too can become part of a small group, how you can grow in your faith, become more mature in your relationship with Jesus Christ and other believers. And also for those who are interested, how you can become a leader as well. So we look forward to that. And so with that, let us begin. With joy we begin our worship, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The reading for this Sunday comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 17. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. 
when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. We are in a sermon series called Ask the Pastor because all our hard-hitting questions, they know the answers to. So this week's question is kind of a hard-hitting question. It's kind of a tough one. It's a question about hell. Is it real? What is it like? Have you ever thought of hell before? Maybe you haven't even heard of hell. Have you heard of heaven? I sure hope so. You know, when we think of heaven, I found a picture online of what maybe a lot of people think heaven is like. There's rainbow and sunshine, maybe some clouds, but most importantly, there's Jesus. And there's no greater image to show than this one of us hugging Jesus. When we die, we can go to heaven. But then there's the opposite of heaven, and there's hell. And I found a picture of what maybe a lot of people think that might look like. Darkness, sadness, fire, kind of just gloomy, right? The devil lives in hell. You know, are heaven and hell real places? Yes, they are. You know, the Bible, my Bible here, the Bible tells us they are real. And God doesn't want us to go to hell when we die. He wants us to go to heaven. And so he sent us Jesus. Ah, Jesus. I love him. Jesus came to this earth and lived a perfect life. And he defeated the devil so that we could go to heaven with him. It's a pretty amazing thing, right? Jesus died for us and did that for us. You know, we don't need to fear hell if we believe in Jesus. If our heart is with Jesus and we trust that he is our savior and we accept that and we love him with what we do, when we do that and we turn to Jesus for forgiveness of our sins, we don't need to fear hell. We don't need to be afraid of that. But there's one thing we could fear. One thing we could fear is that others could go to hell. Others might not know who Jesus is. So there's kind of an urgency there. We want to tell others about Jesus so they too can go to heaven. Boys and girls, let's pray. Will you fold your hands? Dear God, thank you for creating Jesus. Thank you for creating heaven for us to go to in eternity someday. Lord, help us to see the urgency to spread that news to others so that they too can go to heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. I was rather amused when I moved to Saginaw, Michigan for my first job after college to discover that my new state contained both a hell and a paradise. Paradise is in the Upper Peninsula or the, the UP, and, and hell is not too far from Ann Arbor, the home of the University of Michigan. Now, I have no idea if there's any significance to that. I just know that it's about 338 miles or about five and a half hours by car from hell to paradise, depending on which route you take. I recall one particularly cold day that first winter, which, by the way, was, was a whole lot colder than any winter I had ever experienced growing up in Missouri, but, but I digress. I remember that someone brought a rather startling headline to school that they had found in the Ann Arbor News. Now, I kid you not, this is what it said. Hell freezes over. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? Now, in this sermon, I would suggest that, biblically speaking, the real hell is not likely to freeze over. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. This morning, we are continuing 
our series on Ask the Pastor. And several of you have inquired about the phrase, he descended into hell, which is a part of our Apostles' Creed. Now, since we recite the Creed on a regular basis, it just might be helpful to know what it actually means. So let's begin with a rather short primer on the word hell. It comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word that means underworld or realm of the dead. Interestingly enough, the word hell doesn't even appear in the Greek New Testament. Instead, there's one of three words that is used. The first is Hades, which is the Hebrew equivalent of Sheol. Now, in Greek mythology, Hades was the brother of Zeus, the god of the sky, and Poseidon, the god of the sea. And Hades' name literally means the unseen, since he ruled the invisible world of the dead, which was thought to be somewhere under the earth. Now, in both the Old and the New Testaments, Hades, or Sheol, could have one of two meanings. It can either refer to death in the grave in general, where believers and unbelievers go, or it could be the place of judgment and punishment, which we generally think of as as hell, as the destination of, of unbelievers. Now, another word for hell in the Greek is Tartarus. And not like the sauce, but it refers to an even lower level of hell reserved for those who are especially wicked. And then there's the third word, Gehenna, a word that Jesus used which referred to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is a smoldering garbage dump just south and west of the city of Jerusalem. Terribly, child sacrifices were offered there to the pagan god Moloch during the reigns of King Ahaz and Manasseh of Judah in the Old Testament. So Gehenna became a name for hell and its fiery torment. It's reminiscent of the lake of fire, which is described in the book of Revelation. It is the ultimate destination of all of those who are not in Christ, who did not do the will of his father or who did no kindness to the least of his brothers. So when we think of hell, we think of that place that was originally reserved for Satan and his followers, the evil angels who rebelled against God even before Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. It's a place of eternal punishment, a a place of darkness and agony, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. In short, it's a place that we never want to be, a place for the damned, either at the point of death or at the last judgment when Christ returns. So what exactly will hell be like? Well, as I said a few weeks ago, I don't know what heaven is like either, since I've never been there. Though scripture says it's going to be far greater than we can ever imagine. So let me say this then about hell. I've never been there either. But I suspect that it will be even worse than we could ever imagine. This is what Luther had to say. I am as yet not too sure what hell really is like. And it's of little importance whether a person holds hell to be what men now paint or picture it to be. No doubt it is now and will be far worse than anyone is able to describe, picture, or think it to be. Now, before we get to the phrase, he descended into hell, we need to explore a like phrase that Jesus suffered hell. Now, the pursuit of the definition or description of hell may seem to be an intellectual exercise at best, but I believe it is necessary because we need to understand on some level just exactly what Jesus experienced on our behalf. So in the creed, we profess that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, that he died and was buried. This means that it was Christ's suffering that has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. Christ's suffering at the hands of Pilate and the Jewish leaders involves so much more than enduring the 39 lashes of the cat of nine tails and the 
numerous heavy blows from fists and sticks. It was so much more than withstanding the nails of the cross and the crown of thorns jammed on his head. It was far greater than the searing heat of the sun and the withering thirst that led to the sponge of sour vinegar placed at his lips. The weight of the cross was light compared to the weight of our sins which put him there. We, along with the entire human race, lived under the tyranny of sin, death, and the devil. And we, along with the entire human race, stood under the judgment of God and deserved what Christ endured. Through his suffering and death, Jesus paid the entire penalty of our sin and guilt. He defeated Satan by obeying his Father's will, going all the way to the cross, and there he rescued us from the eternal death, the complete and ultimate separation from God. For that is what hell truly is. It's simply the place where God is not. Now, as agonizing and painful as hell is described in the Bible, conjuring up images of eternal punishment, searing fire, and the weeping and gnashing of teeth, the thing that is the most frightening is the prospect of no longer being in God's presence. I mean, can you imagine a lifetime without your husband or wife, your children, your parents? Well, then you can know the agony that the absence of a loved one would provoke. Now multiply that image by a thousandfold, and you have an idea of the hell that Jesus endured when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now imagine the love that you have for those who are closest to you and multiply that by a thousandfold and you have an idea of the love and the sacrifice that Jesus had for you when he endured the cross in the grave and suffered hell for you. So finally, now we can get to the meaning of he descended into hell. From earliest times, Christians have believed that Jesus' descent into hell is most clearly taught in our passage for today from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. So in the context of encouraging Christians who are in danger of suffering persecution for their faith, the apostle Peter writes, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So why did Jesus, after he came to life before his resurrection appearances, preach in the presence of departed unbelievers and the devil and his angels in hell? Was it to give unbelievers a second chance through a proclamation of the gospel? Did Jesus visit hell in order to suffer further? Did he descend to deliver those who died before the flood? Or the Old Testament patriarchs and saints, as some have thought? Or is a reference to Christ's descent no more than a figurative expression for Christ's suffering for all of humanity? Well, Lutherans have held that none of these explanations is acceptable. Lutherans have always understood the Bible to teach that Christ went to hell to declare his triumph as God's Messiah over death and the power of the devil. In fact, in the Lutheran confessional writing, The Formula of Concord, it states, we simply believe that the entire person of Jesus Christ, God and man, descended into hell after the burial, conquered the devil, destroyed hell's power, and took from the devil all his might. It's a victory. No more suffering simply the declaration that it is indeed finished. So what does it all mean for us? Well, I would suggest that Christ's descent into hell means two things for us. First of all, it means that although Christ's descent into hell lies beyond our full understanding, just like we can't fully describe hell itself, we can derive great comfort from this important teaching of the Bible especially in times when our own faith is being tested. We who believe in the exalted and risen Christ 
can be confident and certain that neither hell nor the devil can take captive or ever injure us. We do not need to be afraid of hell or the devil or even death itself because Jesus has defeated them all. Now, this is not to say that you or I will never know despair or sorrow or pain here on earth. We know we will because we already have. It is to say that even in our times of despair or sorrow or pain, that Jesus Christ is still with us. And because Christ has endured hell when he suffered and died on the cross, it's possible for us to endure any kind of despair or sorrow or pain that this life could ever throw at us. And while we may one day have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we know it's only a shadow. And that on the other side of death and the grave is our Savior, Jesus Christ, waiting for us with open arms. My friends, heaven is our home. Eternal life with Jesus is assured. And Satan and hell can never harm us. And secondly, it means that Christ's victory is available for everyone and that no one in this life is ever beyond Christ's reach. And so, as Peter writes, we should always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that we have. Jesus Christ has indeed walked through the valley of the shadow of death and he has paved the way for all people to get to the other side. Let me close with this. There's a delightful scene in Winnie the Pooh that goes something like this. Pooh says, did you fall into the river, Eeyore? Silly of me, wasn't it? Pooh says, is the river uncomfortable this morning? Eeyore says, well, yes, the dampness, you know. You really ought to be more careful. Thanks for the advice. I think you're sinking. Pooh, if it's not too much trouble, would you mind rescuing me? Hell may not freeze over, but Jesus Christ has bridged the gap between hell and paradise with the cross. He has risen from the grave and is victorious over death itself. Hell has no hold on us. The victory's been won. We've been rescued by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Won't you too reach out with a helping hand and share the good news of Jesus with those around you so that he might rescue them as well? Amen. Let us humbly come before our Lord in prayer. Father, we pray for all people that they may have faith in Christ and hear the voice of the calling by your word. For the church, that the people of God may pursue righteousness with peace and joy in their hearts. And for all pastors in their ministry of word and sacrament. And for all vocations to the ministry, that the lives of God's people would be lived overflowing with praise and glory to your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all noble professions and for the flourishing of the arts and music, for favorable weather and the fruits of the earth, and for those unemployed, the poor, the homeless, the hungry, and all people in need, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
for all families and children, single adults and youth, for those who teach and those who learn, that they may advance in wisdom and grace, and for the catechumens and those who teach the faith to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our school and preschool, for our teachers, our students, and their families, that they would be kept safe as they grow in their knowledge of you, of your world, and of your love for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For victims of disaster and for those stricken by illness or infirmity, for the aged and weak, as well as those in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, and for those who grieve the loss of those whom they love. Today we pray especially for Ray Boyer, Shirley Burnett, Kathy Flynn, Jim Kearley, Marlene Laramie, Amy Morgan, Nancy Newman, Ted Ogletree, Don Rode, Paul Ross, Betty Siddons, Steve Wright, and those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the family and friends mourning the loss of Mike Kamita, we pray that your comfort and your peace would uplift them and sustain them during this trying and difficult time of loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the work of God's kingdom in this place, for our faithful support of the church and renewal of our parish life through the means of grace, for our growth in grace, that we may attain to the full stature of Christ, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be merciful to us, O Lord, and hear our prayers. Grant to us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may be led into all truth and be steadfast in the confession of Christ. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in praying the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. to receive Christ's body and blood again this morning in with and under the bread and wine we are reminded that we have already confessed our sins that we have received God's forgiveness through what Christ has done on the cross and through his resurrection that we have not only forgiveness but the promise of new life and salvation as well it was on the very same night in which Christ was betrayed that he took bread, he gave it to his disciples after he had broken it, and he said, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. So take and eat the body of Christ 
given for the forgiveness of your sin. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and after he had given thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This cup is a new testament in my blood which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do in remembrance of me. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. And now the body and blood of our Lord strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. We join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Just a reminder, you can still sign up to be a part of our small group community by either going to our church website or by following the instructions in our most recent e-letter. Go in peace and serve the Lord with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We join in singing our closing song. Salvation.